here. It is now one o'clock, which means we can go ahead and begin with our program. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, here again to another edition of Planetarium Online. Uh, my name is Andrew. I am one of the Planetarium Educators at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about planets talking about four planets you can see in your sky tonight and throughout the entire rest of the fall. We'll be answering your questions. Uh, that'll be kind of a bulk of our program today. So if you have any questions about planets, about the solar system, you can write them in the comments at any point during the program today. Um, I will answer as many of them as I can. Um, I also have my wonderful colleague, Krista, in the comments who will be typing out some answers to your questions as well. Um, a few real quick uh, housekeeping things before we do begin. Um, first of all, uh, Liberty Science Center and the Planetarium are at this point uh, back open. Um, so we, we are, are open currently uh, Thursdays through Sundays running Planetarium shows pretty much all day uh, and this coming Monday uh, will also be open so we hope to see you by uh, coming by Liberty Science Center um, and we'll be continuing to do these planetarium online streams at least through uh, October probably also through November as well um, our show next week though will not be at our usual Thursday at one o'clock our show next week will be uh, uh, Thursday at 5 p.m. So that's a show that we are doing, uh, talking all about uh, uh, one of our favorite uh, science fiction uh, property, something that uh, comes around uh, every Halloween, every October season, that is War of the Worlds. Uh, we'll be talking about Mars as well. That'll be next Thursday at 5 Um and also, if you would like to support uh, Liberty Science Center and our Planetarium Online streams, you can do that using the Donate button, which is somewhere on your screen around my head. Depends on which version of Facebook you have, um, but that is the best way to support us if you are able to and, and, and if you'd like to. Um, I think that's everything. I think that's everything I, I wanted to get through before the program today. Again, if you've got any questions, ask them in the comments. We'll, we'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and begin today. So we're going to begin uh, with our uh, planetarium software today, looking outside at the sky that we would see tonight. So we're looking at the sky uh, tonight, Thursday, October 8th, at about 8.30 in the evening. This is the point in the evening where it's gotten nice and dark, about two hours after sunset. And we're standing right outside uh, Liberty Science Center. This is what you'd see from pretty much anywhere in the in the northern hemisphere, anywhere in the United States. This is what you'd be able to see. Now, looking toward the south, we're marking that here with this great big red S. There are two planets we can find that are pretty bright in our sky. Um, so look around at our screen here, uh, kind of in the southern chunk of the sky here for the brightest little dot of light that you can see. And that is going to be planet. Now planets, when we see them in the sky, look a whole lot like stars. Um, in most cases though, the planets shine much brighter than the other stars around them. Uh, looking toward the south, this very bright point of light here is uh, the first planet that we're going to be seeing this evening and probably the easiest planet to find this evening. Uh, this planet is so bright because it is the largest planet in the entire solar system, which means that this is the beautiful planet Jupiter. Now, I mentioned Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. Well, just, just how big is it? Well, it turns out if we took Jupiter uh, and we kind of took the top off of it and we lined up a bunch of Earths inside of it, but 11 planet Earths would fit from one end of Jupiter to the other. But by diameter, Jupiter is um, about 11 times Earth's diameter, which means about 1,300 Earths would fit 
inside of the whole entire volume of Jupiter. Jupiter is really far from the Earth, right? Jupiter is hundreds of millions of miles away, even at its closest. That means we haven't sent any people to visit Jupiter quite yet. Um, it's just too far away, too dangerous. So to study a planet like Jupiter, we can use little robots to help us out. This little robot we're seeing here is a spacecraft named Juno. It has spent the last few years orbiting Jupiter, studying it, and helping us understand better how Jupiter works, helping us better understand um, Jupiter's storms, its weather, and how Jupiter changes over time. And we do this because, well, it can really expand our view of a planet by getting up nice and close to it. But Juno doesn't spend most of its life really close to Jupiter. In fact, it spends most of its life millions of miles away. Jupiter is, well, sends out a lot of radiation, which is dangerous to a spacecraft like Juno. So most of its life it spends really far away. But every 53 days or so, Juno gets nice and close to Jupiter, just a, a couple thousand miles above the upper sort of cloud tops here of the planet. Doing that, it allows Juno to better explore cloud tops, the weather, and, well, just how Jupiter works. So one of Juno's main goals is to understand the weather of Jupiter. Um, Jupiter is covered in storm, right? It's a great big gigantic ball of gas, the inside of which is really, really hot, which means that a lot of weather happens. The largest storm on Jupiter here is called the Great Red Spot. The storm, uh, as we see it today, uh, is about one and a half times the size of the Earth and is over 400 years old. It's like a big hurricane almost, and it sort of rotates and swirls around. Um, unlike a hurricane on the Earth, which will eventually run into land, slow it down, Jupiter has no land. It has no solid surface, so there's nothing to really stop the Great Red Spot from going. It is slowly shrinking, though, and in fact, if we look at Jupiter in a picture that was taken at the end of August by the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we can really begin to see, uh, hopefully in just a moment here, once the image loads, if it's going to load, there it goes, we can see that the Great Red Spot is actually quite a bit smaller than it would have been 10 or 20 years ago. Now it's about one and a half times the size of the Earth, but that's not all that we see in this beautiful Hubble telescope image of Jupiter. We can see one of its moons over here, Europa, uh, uh, hanging out nice, nice and close, uh, actually behind Jupiter in this picture, just coming around in its orbit. We can see one very sort of elongated, long storm up in the northern hemisphere of Jupiter. And also down beneath the Great Red Spot, we find a storm here. A lot of astronomers actually call uh, a Red Spot Junior because about 20 years ago, this white sort of gray colored storm also red small in the Great Red Spot, so they began to call it Red Spot Junior. Over the next decade or so, this storm began to change color to the white that we see today, and it stayed that way. If you look very close at the center, it's getting a little orange again. But we suspect that in the next maybe five years or so, this storm is going to become more red again. We don't really know why this happened. We don't know fully why the storm changed colors. Great red spot sometimes looks more orange or yellow. At least at the end of August, it was a nice, beautiful red color that we see here today. So Jupiter is a planet that is always, always changing. Um, and so using Juno, uh, helps us understand it, but we also make observations of it using telescopes, like Hubble. Um, that Hubble telescope is what took this picture here right now. So we're looking at this gorgeous picture. 
read through the comments here really quickly, see uh, what questions we have that we can answer. Let me see. So, uh, so John asks a really, really good question. Uh, how do they measure distance and the mass of a planet in space, or is it estimated numbers? That's a really, really good question. So measuring the distance to a planet, um, we can do actually uh, uh, using, using radar. So essentially, radar is us sending a signal, like pulse of, of like radio waves, for example, at a planet, and timing how long it takes those radio waves to get there. It's one way that we can measure the distance to, uh, to planet. There are other ways. To measure the mass of a planet, though, we actually use the orbits of moons. For example, this, uh, at least one way we can do it. Um, right here, we see Jupiter's moon Europa. By measuring how long it takes uh, uh, Europa to, to make an orbit around Jupiter um, and how far away it is, we can actually measure the mass of Jupiter itself. Um, so there's there's a few other ways to measure the masses of uh, of planets, but those are that's sort of the the one that we, that we originally used to measure the mass of of Jupiter. That's a really good question. Uh, uh, Victoria asks the million dollar question: Why does the Great Red Spot shrink? We have absolutely no idea. We really don't know. Um, Something is causing it to lose energy. We don't really know why. We don't know what's causing that to happen. That's a, it's a mystery, right? Um, it's incredible that we've been studying this storm for hundreds of years now, and we still don't know why it shrinks. Or fully, we don't understand why it changes color either. That's pretty cool to think about, the fact that there's a lot that we still don't know about Jupiter. Okay, so Lauren asks a really good question. Why are some planets bigger and some planets smaller? So I'm going to answer that question a little later on in the program. A really good question, but I'm going to answer it later on in, in the program later on in the program because I've got something really cool to show you to help us answer the question. Let's see, so I think those are all the questions that I'm seeing right now. Ah, so one, I'm, I'm seeing one black holes question. Uh, so Margie asks, could a black hole disintegrate due to vir virtual particle release? Uh, yes, that is possible, um, but it's very slow. Only if a black hole didn't have anything else to sort of eat to keep it going. Um, that, that, that could happen where a black hole over time evaporates due to uh, a virtual particle release, something called Hawking radiation. So, uh, always happy to answer black holes questions. I want to know more about black holes, though. Uh, we've done a lot of black hole shows, I think three of them now, here on Planetarium Online throughout the past few months. So you can check out our Facebook page, um, our YouTube channel as well, for recordings of some of our black hole shows. So back here looking at our evening sky, we're still looking toward the south. We're looking about 8.30 at the sky tonight. We've already found Jupiter hanging out right here, nice and bright in the sky. Looking over to the left of Jupiter, you'll find another pretty bright dot of light, which is um, not as bright as Jupiter, for the reason that it's further away from us. Um, it's another gas giant planet, though. A planet you probably know best for the shape of its ring. This is the beautiful, wonderful planet Saturn. So Saturn is about the same size as Jupiter. It's a little bit smaller. Um, only about a thousand Earths could fit inside of it. Um, and it's further away from us than Jupiter is. Um, Saturn can get almost a billion miles away from the Earth, incredibly far away. We know Saturn best for those beautiful rings that it has. So uh, let's go ahead and take a trip a little bit closer to Saturn, explore those rings a little bit better. So we're looking at Saturn here. Um, put up, it's just a little model next to Saturn, our very own planet Earth. 
just to see how small the Earth is compared to Saturn, and its rings especially. To scale also is the Moon. It turns out the rings of Saturn from end to end almost stretch all the way from the Earth to the Moon. They're about 175,000 miles across. Huge. As wide as they are in diameter, the rings of Saturn are actually very, very thin. They're in most places between 100 and like 300 feet thick. They're very, very thin. And we're talking like the, like the, like the size of a, of a football field, which is pretty small for something as wide as Saturn's rings. The rings are made up of lots of little tiny chunks of ice and rock that used to be part of a moon that about 100 or 200 million years ago got ripped to pieces by Saturn's gravity leaving behind the little chunks of ice and rock we see today. Inside the rings, we also find little moons, like this little moon right here named Pan, which carves out this sort of gap inside of the rings. It's hard for us to imagine, though, Saturn without its rings. The rings haven't always been here, and they won't always be here. In another 200 million years or so, these rings will be gone completely. They'll be gone completely as these little tiny chunks of ice and rock fall into Saturn. Saturn is home to many more moons than just Pan and the other ones that live inside of the ring. Saturn is home to the second largest moon in the entire solar system. This is the moon Titan. Now, Titan is different from pretty much every other moon in the solar system because Titan has an atmosphere. It's got air surrounding it. Not air that we can breathe, unfortunately, but it still does have air that surrounds it. Titan is the second largest moon that we find here in our beautiful solar system. Compare it here for a moment to our planet Earth and the moon to give you a little sense of scale here. So we have the moon over here on the right, Earth over here on the left. So for a moon, Titan is pretty big, but it Certainly isn't quite as big as our own wonderful planet Earth, as we very quickly <laughs> spin around uh, our three planet models here. Saturn is home to more moons than just Titan and Pan. It's, Saturn's got 82 moons, right? It's got 82 of them. More moons than any other planet in the entire solar system. It's a very, very busy place, the area around planet Saturn. Looking back here toward the south, we see once again Saturn and Jupiter. These two planets will be visible in the sky until about the end of December this year, and they'll be set beneath the horizon. So lots of chances to check them out. Um, tonight, if it's clear, it's going to be a, a great night. Tomorrow will be a great night. The next night, also a great night. Um, assuming it's clear, we'll have lots of chances to see Jupiter and Saturn. Let me see. So now that we've seen Saturn, let me bring up, uh, zoom up Saturn a little bit here. Um, if we see it once again. Let me read through the comments here, see if we have any uh, Saturn questions for us to answer. Okay, so I see a question uh, from Christine. Which is bigger, um, Titan? Or Venus or Mercury. So, so Titan is definitely smaller. So, so, so Venus is definitely larger than, uh, definitely larger than Titan. Um, and maybe Krista can answer the other part of your question because I don't remember if Titan, uh, how Titan and Mercury compare to each other right now. So maybe, maybe Krista can answer that, uh, can answer that, that question for you in the in, in the comments here. Let me see. So, uh, so Amanda uh, and uh, her first grade class wants to know: Do Saturn's rings fade away? That's such a good question. And the answer is yes. The rings of Saturn do slowly fade away. We're talking over the course of millions of years. This is going to happen. So, the rings of Saturn are going to be here for at least the next hundred million years or so. 
they are very, 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 very slowly fading away. Little chunks of, of ice and rock that make them up are slowly falling into the atmosphere of Saturn. Saturn's gravity and its magnetic fields help cause that to happen. So it is happening, but very, very slowly. Very, very slowly. Let's see, so, um, so is Titan possible for life? That is a very, very great question from, uh, Ilya, that is such a great question. Is it possible for there to be life on Titan? So, unfortunately, I believe the answer to our question is no. We are not likely to find life on Titan. Um, because Titan, although it does have, uh, because it, it does have atmosphere, uh, it does have an atmosphere. Its atmosphere doesn't have oxygen, um, which is something that, that we believe life needs to survive. So let me just move us over to Titan here a little bit. But the atmosphere of Titan and the surface of Titan are very cold. The surface of Titan here is like minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So conditions just aren't good on the surface there for life. Um... It also, we know of, has no liquid water, which is another important thing for life. So we're probably not going to find life uh, uh, on Titan at, at any point. Well, as always, we could be wrong. There could be something about Titan that we don't fully understand quite yet. Isn't it possible? So John wants to see what Saturn would, would look like without its rings. Let me see if I can do that here. Let me bring us back over Saturn and see if I can turn off the... The, uh, turn off the, the rings of Saturn for us. So, we find that button to make that happen. So without its rings, Saturn would look like this. An extremely different looking planet, to say the least. Um, still, still a wonderful place. Still has lots of cool features on it, even without its rings. Storm like this one up here on its north pole, um, but yeah, this is what Saturn would look like without its rings. Really, a planet that most of us would recognize, to be totally honest with you. So Christopher asks a really good question: Do we think that planets can grow much larger in volume than Jupiter? Or as the planet's mass grows, does it get sort of uh, sort of crumpled down into a smaller volume? That is that is a really really good question. Um, so so planets can get quite a bit larger than Jupiter. Um, we've discovered planets that are maybe four or five times more larger than Jupiter is. Um, so gravity doesn't really cause planets at that size to really uh, crumple down. Um, because there, there's usually extra heat um, coming from, from the inside of a really big planet that can kind of have the opposite effect. So heat from the inside of, of a planet pushes outwards, um, so it can cause it to sort of to expand a, a little bit as well. So gravity definitely partially could cause a planet to shrink down, but it's counteracted by, by other forces as well. Um, it's a really, really... Um, the questions that we have are, we have so many, uh, so a Jupiter question that, 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 that I missed. So does, does the Great Red Spot on Jupiter have the same kind of particle outflow as a black hole does? So we don't, I, I'm not totally sure. I don't think so. Um, I think, for, for the most part, particles that are part of the Great Red Spot or that are a part of Jupiter stay a part of Jupiter. It doesn't really lose material. Its gravity is so strong that it doesn't really, uh, um, it, it really holds on to, to all of its material pretty well. All right. Come on. 
That's the only question. I think we answered most of them at the very least. Uh, if there's any more uh, questions we have about Saturn, we'll be able to circle back and answer more of them in a little bit. But there are two more planets we have to look at in the sky tonight, and so a lot of other things about our solar system to check out as well. We're looking here back out at the sky about 8.30 this evening, uh, Thursday, October the 8th. We've seen Jupiter, we've seen Saturn. To find the third planet in our sky uh, this evening, we do need to spin ourselves around until we are facing toward the east. So we're going to spin our sky around 90 degrees, turn ourselves toward the east. Doing that, we're going to find a very bright red spot of light. Um, this is the brightest planet going to be in the sky tonight, even brighter than Jupiter, brighter than any of these stars in the sky. So a really great thing to find. We kind of low in the sky toward the east. And whenever we find a planet in the sky that looks red, First place my mind goes to is, of course, to the red planet Mars. So Mars is a beautiful place. Um, right now, Mars is really close to our planet Earth, um, but now it's beginning it's, um, uh, it's beginning to move away from us once again. So uh, tonight is the brightest that Mars is going to be for about the next two years. So lots of great chances to see Mars, but every night for the next several months, it's going to be getting fainter and fainter and fainter in the sky. Mars itself, though, is, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, is a wonderful planet. Um, it's nice and red thanks to rust that we find in its soil. Um, and Mars is probably the next place that we're going to be sending humans other than the moon. We're hoping to send humans to visit Mars sometime in the next 20 or 30 years. Meaning some of you watching this right now might be the first astronauts to walk around on the surface of Mars. Pretty cool. And Mars has always been my favorite planet for a few reasons. Um, I think it's the planet that has sort of the biggest mystery of any planet in the solar system, and I love mysteries. If we look at planet Mars today, it is extremely different from the Earth, right? The Earth is covered in water, it's got clouds, it's got trees, it's got all of us, it's got life. Mars doesn't have any of those things. Mars has no water on its surface, it's got no clouds, a very thin atmosphere, and so far, no living things, until some of us humans go and walk around on the surface. But Mars used to look very different from the Mars that we see today. About three and a half billion years ago, Mars would have looked more like this. It would have looked a lot more like the Earth, to be totally honest. It would have had water, it would have had an atmosphere, it would have had clouds, it would have been a better temperature. Today, Mars is cold, but three and a half billion years ago, it would have been warmer. So the biggest mystery in the solar system, in my opinion anyway, is what happened to this water. And back when Mars had water, but it had life. The conditions would have been there. It would have had water, it would have had air, it would have had nice temperatures. Could there have been alien life on Mars three or three and a half billion years ago? We don't know don't know. We can't exactly go back in time to find out. So to answer that mystery, we need to be sort of like detectives, almost, and use what we find on Mars today to help us understand what Mars used to be like way, 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 way back in the day. So we're going to be sending a spacecraft to actually visit Mars. It's going to be landing right here. It's called Jezero Crater. Uh, it's going to be landing this coming February. It's landing in Jezero Crater because Jezero Crater used to be a lake, a lake full of water. And so by finding and studying a place that used to have water in it, we think we give ourselves the best chance to find somewhere there used to be life. The rover that will be landing there is named Perseverance and landing this coming February equipped with a drill and lots of cameras to study the surface. 
It's, it's bringing along with it, though, a little helicopter named Ingenuity. And this Ingenuity helicopter is going to be able to actually fly through the very thin atmosphere that we find on Mars. It's going to be able to fly maybe a couple hundred feet at a time to sort of scout ahead for other really interesting locations for Perseverance to eventually drive to. So this is such a cool mission, and I can't wait for it to land. And this coming February, um, when that happens, we'll be talking about it here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to do a Facebook Live show uh, talking uh, all about its initial findings. We'll be talking about it in the planetarium. So uh, keep your eyes out for Perseverance and Ingenuity landing on the surface of Mars this coming February, which I could not be more excited for. Its goal is to better understand whether or not there used to be life on Mars, right? This is probably the best location for us to study, answer that question. So hopefully Perseverance can do that for us um, when it eventually does land on the surface. Lots of other great things though to explore on Mars, which we're always doing, right? We're always exploring Mars, we're always learning more, always learning more about the planet, which is great. Because again, Mars is my favorite, so uh, always, always love to learn more about it. Let's see. So, uh, so, so, so lots of questions um, about Mars. So, so, so um, related questions. So, why did Mars get colder? Why did Mars lose its water? Um, and sort of why did Mars change? We don't know for sure, but this is, I think, the best hypothesis that we have so far to explain. So for a planet to have warmer temperatures, for a planet to have water, it needs to have an atmosphere. And for a planet to have an atmosphere, it needs to have a magnetic field around the planet. So a magnetic field around a planet helps to protect its atmosphere from solar radiation, from, from harmful um, radiation coming from the sun. Now to have a magnetic field, a planet needs to have a really warm molten core to it. And because Mars is small, it's half the size of the Earth, Mars lost a lot of its heat very quickly. Not very quickly, but it lost a lot of its heat over time. So as the inside of Mars cooled down, its magnetic fields stopped being active. That meant it lost its atmosphere. That means it got colder. That means it couldn't hold on to its water, and that water eventually evaporated and was blown away into space. So that's our best idea. We don't know. Mars got colder. Mars lost its atmosphere and its water because the inside of Mars cooled down, meaning it couldn't hold on to those things anymore. Well, again, we don't know for sure. That's just our one of our best ideas so far. But Katie asks, how do we know Jezero Crater used to be a lake? It's actually a really, really great question. So when we study Jezero Crater um, and other places on Mars, um, what we find that they have a ton of things in common with dried up lakes or dried up rivers that we find on the surface of the Earth. So when we study Jezero Crater here very, very closely, we find evidence through the water here. The soil looks different than the rest of Mars. It looks a lot like a dried up lake does on the Earth. When we study this area up here, sort of on the upper part of our screen, this used to be a river. And when we study this, it looks almost exactly like a dried up river does here on the Earth. So, and, and water exists in a place for a really long time, whether it's flowing like in a river or it's static like in a lake, it changes the sort of the texture of the particles that make up the soil. Um, it, it makes them more round. And we can actually study, sort of round them off, and we can study those features. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that this used to be full of water. There used to be a river running into it. Um, we're very confident. 
Again, we can never know 100% for sure. We can't go back in time and look for, for certain, but I'm very confident that this used to be a lake. We're like 99.999% sure because of all of that evidence that we found so far. Um, someone also asked, I'm sorry, I forgot your, I, 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 I used your name. I see, uh, Miriam, what about curiosity? Well, curiosity is still on Mars today. Still there, is active, it's driving around. And in fact, curiosity has been such a successful mission that a lot of perseverance was built off of the same things that worked for curiosity. So curiosity is still going. It's still doing really great science. Um, perseverance is to be able to study a different location. I think that's what's so exciting about it. To be able to study a different place on on Mars, other than what curiosity was able to. Okay, so lots of questions. So uh, Amy and um. Um, the, or my uh, Facebook chat just here goes, it's back. Okay. Um, so, so Amy wants to know if we are losing our magnetic field, and Amanda wants to know uh, will the Earth have the same result as Mars? So thankfully, the Earth is uh, is quite a bit larger than Mars. Because of that, the Earth is able to hold on to its temperature, its heat inside the planet a lot better than Mars is. So the Earth's magnetic field is not weakening. The, the Earth really is in no danger of, of turning into Mars. Because Earth is about twice as big, it's more massive, inside of the planet holds on to its heat better than, than the inside of Mars was able to. We're in no danger of losing our magnetic field or uh, or or losing our atmosphere or our water, at least naturally. Of course, now Earth is going through climate crisis. Global warming is changing the Earth in different ways, and causing the Earth to warm up. And that's having sort of almost the opposite effect to what happened on Mars. We are making our atmosphere thicker. It means the Earth is trapping heat better. That's what's causing climate change. Is we're making the Earth better at trapping heat. It means the Earth is warming. That's going to cause a whole different kind of, of effect. That's something that's being caused by humans, meaning there's something we can do about that. There's something we can do about climate change and about global warming. Um, we're not going to go the same way as, as Mars. Um, so nothing to worry about there. But I see lots of Mars questions. So many Mars questions. We can answer maybe one more, more Mars question here. So Victoria wants to know why does Mars have ice caps? Wonderful, wonderful question. So when Mars lost its water, it did not lose all of its water, it just lost most of it. Any of the water that was left. I um, uh, uh, ended up sort of collecting at the North and the South Pole and freezing. Um, it essentially cooled down faster than, than, than it was able to um, was able to evaporate. So it does have ice caps on the North and the South Pole, but most of the ice, the caps, is actually not liquid water ice. It's mostly something called dry ice um, or carbon dioxide ice. There is some water there. Um, that stuff just froze before it could fully evaporate on, on the pole. So there's the south pole of Mars, been around up here now to the north pole of Mars, um, which when this image was taken was larger than the south pole. Um, so it does have polar ice caps, just like the Earth has polar ice caps. Question. So let us, let us go back here to our evening sky. We're looking back 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the evening. We're going to spin ourselves back around toward the east. And to find the fourth planet in the sky, we are going to need to move ourselves very, very uh, early into the morning. So if we watch our clock go by now, we're watching Mars rise in the sky and eventually stop around 5 o'clock in the morning. 
nice and early while I'm still usually asleep. Um, if you do wake up this early or stay up this late, you can find another planet shining nice and bright here toward the east. This is the wonderful planet Venus. So Venus here is incredibly bright. You really can't miss it if you're up around 5 or 5.30, really anywhere between like 4.30 and 5.30. Really can't miss it. Venus is incredibly bright. It's beautiful to see. So uh, if you find yourself awake, please step outside toward the east. Um, it's a, a great planet. Look at it. Well, Venus is the second planet from the sun, but even that... That being said, Venus is still the hottest planet in the solar system. It's hotter than Mercury. Because Venus has an atmosphere, a really, really thick atmosphere that traps heat on the surface. It keeps Venus a nice warm 870 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. So Venus is, um, on the surface anyway, a really, really tough place talking 870 degrees, it's covered in mountain, got volcanoes on the surface. The surface of Venus is not a place we are ever going to find life. However, clouds of Venus, let me bring them back up for us here, the clouds of Venus are potentially a different story. If we go about 30 miles up into the atmosphere of Venus, 30 miles up, Conditions are better. Instead of being 870 degrees, it's more like 70 degrees. So scientists have wondered for a pretty long time, is it possible for there to be life in the clouds of Venus? We still aren't sure. But earlier this month, or sorry, earlier last month, I forget it's October already, uh, September, um, Astronomers presented a really interesting discovery. Uh, using telescopes from here on the Earth, astronomers studied what the atmosphere of Venus is actually made of, its chemical composition. And found a really, these scientists found a very interesting chemical in the atmosphere of Venus called phosphine. Phosphine, uh, little molecules look, look like this. And phosphine is an interesting chemical because on the Earth, produced by living things. We don't know of any natural process on the Earth that creates phosphine. What so raises the possibility could this phosphine, the atmosphere, of Venus, caused by some kind of living thing, a microbe, or some kind of bacteria. You don't know what caused this phosphine. Life is just one of many, many possibilities. It turns out we also find phosphine on other, uh, in the atmospheres of other planets in the solar system. We find phosphine in the atmosphere of Jupiter, for example created in Jupiter's atmosphere because Jupiter has some very strange atmospheric chemistry to it and create phosphine. It's possible that the phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus is caused by just some funky, some funky chemistry happening in the clouds of Venus. We don't know if phosphine is, caused, is created by life on Venus, but it does raise that possibility. In my opinion, Venus is a planet that's gone really under understudied for the past uh, few decades. And so hopefully with this really cool discovery, it'll lead us to studying Venus even more. It doesn't mean we found life. It does raise the possibility, which I think is a really, really cool one. There could be life in the clouds of Venus. Um, who knows? There's going to be a lot of science currently being done, lots of science being done in the coming years to help us better understand the answers to that question once and for all. Um, that is another big mystery uh, uh, of, uh, of the solar system. We're just beginning to understand a bit better now. So, 
this answer some Venus questions. Ah, cool. Tracy wants to know, isn't the atmosphere toxic on Venus? Absolutely. It is toxic to, to most forms of life that we know of on the Earth, right? So it'd be toxic to us, certainly. Um, life on the Earth, anyway, can survive in some pretty toxic places. Life on the Earth can survive in uh, really deep in the ocean where, where most other life forms couldn't. Um, microbes and bacteria are very resilient. So even though the atmosphere of Venus is toxic to us, it would be toxic to most living things on the Earth, there are some living things that would survive there. Um, even though it's a very chaotic place, a very, a very bad place for us humans. Um, Amy wants to know, could Earth become like Venus? And Amy, I'm very glad that you asked that question. Because if we look at Mars and Venus as two examples of what could happen to the Earth in the future, now Earth is on a path to become more like Venus than we are to becoming more like Mars because of global warming. Venus stays so warm because of its really thick atmosphere, which traps heat on the surface. The same thing is happening to the Earth right now. As humans are causing climate change to happen, we are causing our atmosphere to get thicker. I don't think the Earth, even in the worst scenario, will ever get quite as hot as Venus, simply for the fact that we're further from the sun. But are slowly becoming more like Venus as time goes by. As we continue to take really bad care of our planet, as, as fossil fuel emissions continue to go the way that they are, Earth is getting warmer. Um, and we can do something about it, thankfully. Venus is stuck the way it is, but we, we can still do a lot to keep the Earth from turning into Venus. Um, thankfully, we still have time so, um, do that. Victoria wants to know, is the atmosphere of Venus the thickest atmosphere of any of the rocky planets? Victoria, that is exactly correct. Venus has the thickest atmosphere of any of the rocky planets. Um, uh, by, by far. It's about a hundred times thicker than the Earth's atmosphere. So it's very, very thick. So Tracy wants to know, would it be possible to colonize Venus in the future with the right precautions? Um, the surface of Venus, I think, is a place that we will never be able to colonize. It's just too hot there. But if you are a fan of Star Wars, like I am, in Star Wars, they have cloud cities where they, uh, in this fantasy sci-fi world, have actually built uh, cities that float in the atmospheres of planets. Our best chance to colonize Venus would be to float a city in the cloud. Um, is that possible? Well, it's, it's hard to say. Um, but if we wanted to live on Venus, that would be our best way to do it, is to live in the clouds. Um, if we could float a city or float something in the clouds, that'd be uh, pretty cool. That'd be, be pretty cool. At this point, we're running a little bit low on our time here. Um, so there is just one more thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, this is maybe the question that we get in the planetarium the most often about planets. And that's something to do with how our solar system is sort of built. We're looking here at the inner part of our solar system. We have the sun and the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Um, so uh, Victoria mentioned earlier the idea of rocky planets. Those are these four planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars are rocky planets the closest four planets to the sun. Moving out into the outer solar system though, what we find is that these outer four planets are all gas giants, meaning they are all made of gases. 
Jupiter being the largest, Saturn being the second largest, Uranus and Neptune being about the same size, falling somewhere between Earth and Jupiter size scale. So why is it that Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are gas giant planets, while Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are rocky planets? It's a really great question, and it's one of my favorite questions to get, and one of my favorite questions to answer. Because it all has to do with how our solar system was created, how it was born. Back in the day, we're talking not one, two, three, about five or six billion years ago. The solar system didn't exist yet. It was here was a gigantic cloud of gas. And this cloud of gas is what eventually turned into the solar system, at least part of this cloud of gas. This cloud of gas over time shrank down and formed the sun. The leftovers from this cloud formed the planets of the solar system. So leftover gas and dust formed the other planets. And so its core, this cloud of gas, most of the gas that was in it, in the center of it, was used up by the sun, meaning there wasn't any gas left in the inner part of the solar system to form around the rocky planets. All that was left to form the rocky planets was dust and rocky material. Further away from the sun, there was gas that the sun didn't use up when it was born. So all this leftover gas could form into its own planets. Jupiter, Saturn, eventually Uranus, and, and Neptune. So the inner four planets are rocky because there just wasn't any gas left for the sun was formed. The outer planets are made of gas because there's... There was gas left behind. There was gas left over. So it all has to do with what was around when these planets formed. There wasn't any gas around to make the Earth a gas giant. So all it had was rocks. All it had was dust and dirt, which is good for us, right? If the Earth was a gas giant, we wouldn't be here. So I'm glad that the sun used up all that gas as it formed. And I'm, I'm very, very glad to, to hear that many of you would also like to live in Cloud City. That'd be pretty cool. But I would love to live in a Cloud City. Uh, either Venus, Jupiter, something like that. Pretty cool. Um, all right, so at this point, um, we have answered a lot of questions. We've seen four planets. Jupiter, Saturn, Mars in the uh, in the evening, Venus in the morning, almost two o'clock, which means almost out of our time. I'm going to stick around for another few minutes to answer any more questions uh, that you might have. Um, while I'm waiting for some of those questions to come in, though, a few uh, very very quick things. Um, again, Liberty Science Center and the Planetarium are back. Open. We are open uh, Thursdays through Sundays, um, and this coming Monday we will also be open. I'll be in the planetarium this coming Monday. I'll be uh, presenting all of our shows that day. So if you want to come by and, and, and check us out, that's going to be a wonderful day to do that. Um, also, also uh, opening this this weekend at Liberty Science Center is a new exhibit called Story Time. Uh, uh, it is it is one of our uh, young learner uh, uh, exhibits, uh, covering uh, lots uh, covering lots of, of exhibits from lots of popular children's uh, stories. Like one of my one of my, one of my favorite books uh, growing up, "If You Give a Mouse a Cookie," it was one of my favorite books growing up. Um, so I'm very excited to check out uh, that exhibit, which is opening tomorrow. Um, I will be uh, open. Um, uh, all all weekend as well. Uh, one final thing, if you want to support Liberty Science Center, uh, you can do that using the donate button, which is somewhere on your screen right now. 
um, the best way to financially support Liberty Science Center and our mission to continue to inspire the next generation of scientists, engineers, doctors, um, which now is more important than ever. So with that being said, let me check back in comment section here, see what other questions we have. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So Tracy wants to know, aren't Uranus and Neptune technically ice giants? They are. How did they cool down? Question. So it depends on which astronomer you talk to, whether Uranus and Neptune are called ice giants or gas giants. Some astronomers just use different definitions. They're called ice giants because they're really cold. They're colder, they're called ice giants sometimes because they're further away from the sun. They are so much further away from the sun than Jupiter and Saturn that they actually form uh, uh, kinds of ice sort of in their atmosphere. And their core is made up of a lot of different kinds of ice, not just water ice, things like methane ice, nitrogen ice, um, which is why we sometimes call them ice giants. Um, so, so this is Uranus, this is, uh, we'll look at Neptune here. We have a complete view of all of the planets of, of our solar system. We need to look at Mercury in a sec. Um, so they're called ice giants because they're cold, right? And they're cold because they're really far away from the sun. Um, billions and uh, a few billion miles anyway. Okay, so, so Lauren wants to know, how do Saturn's rings stay separated? The rings of Saturn stay separated in, in, a, in a few different ways. So they stay separate from the main body of Saturn. You can see in this area here, there are no rings. That happens because well, anything closer to Saturn and, and this sort of inner edge here would fall into the planet. Um, and they stay together sort of traveling around um, Saturn because they're in sort of a sort of a sort of a stable orbit around Saturn. Um, we find lots of little sort of separations though between the parts of the rings. Um, because there's, there's little gaps, there's little moons that form gaps inside of the ring. Um, they stay separate from the planet itself um, because they are in a pretty stable orbit around the planet. Uh, so Victoria wants to know, was the sun more like a black hole when the solar system formed than now? A really, really good question. So when the solar system first formed, um, the sun was not like a black hole. The sun um, never had enough mass to become a black hole, um, and it never will become a black hole, thankfully for us. In its early years, though, the, the, the sun was quite a bit hotter. So part of the reason why life exists on the Earth now is because the sun itself cooled down over time, right? But it, it was never quite like a black hole. It was more just like a hotter star. But thankfully, over time, it cooled down for us, which is great um, for us. So to complete our view of all eight of our planets today, let me show us Mercury. Just for completeness's sake, we've seen now all eight planets of the solar system. We've seen a couple of moons. Um, we've even seen the sun a little bit, how the sun formed. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today, but as I'm no longer seeing any more questions in the chat, let's go ahead and wrap up our show today. Thank you all so much once again for tuning in for another Planetarium Online. Um, we'll be live again next week, next Thursday, this time though at 5 p.m. We'll be talking about uh, Mars, we'll be talking about part of the worlds. Um, uh, and, and how that relates to Mars and the Halloween season. 
So uh, until until next time, everyone, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day, um, and we will see you back here next week. Thank you so much.